starting off strong with number 10, Vesna Vulvovic. Vesna Vulvovic holds the title in the Guinness Book of World Records as the highest fall survive without a parachute. Before her name was even known worldwide, this Serbian woman was a simple flight stewardess. The 22 year old became a flight attendant after she discovered a love for travel when she went to England. She joined Yugoslavia's largest airline in 1971, but eight months later, her life would change forever. After just 46 minutes, flight 367 flying from Copenhagen Airport, the baggage compartment exploded. The plane split in half mid air and began tumbling from a height 333,330 feet. By some miracle, Vesna was the only survivor of the 28 people who were on the craft. Bruno Honk, a World War II medic, luckily, who was nearby, was the one that found her and kept her alive long enough for help to arrive. It was her screams that brought him to the craft. Vesna sustained two broken legs, three broken vertebra, a fractured pelvis, broken ribs, and a fractured skull. After over a week in a coma and 10 months in hospital, Vesna was able to walk again, with no memory however of what happened because of the crash. Investigators discovered that Vesna had been pinned to the falling debris by a food cart, which may be the reason she survived. The most crazy thing is, Vesna continued to travel after the ordeal. What a boss. Coming in at number 9 we have Yaha Abdi. Yaha Abdi who was originally from Santa Clara, California ran away from home on April 20th, 2014. Abdi left home with quite the ambitious mission. Sadly his mother was in a refugee camp in Ethiopia and he was hoping to save her. Abdi made his way to the Minata San Jose International Airport. Once there he climbed the airport fence and after lingering for 6 hours he snuck into a Boeing 767 through the landing gear and was hidden on board. The plane then reached altitudes of 38,000 feet and temperatures dropped to negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. But miraculously, Abdi was able to survive the crazy flight. How? The sub-zero temperatures and low oxygen levels at such crazy altitudes pushed his body into a state of suspended animation, which let him survive the 5 hour trip. But once they arrived at the Hawaii airport, Abdi was found and was looked after by medics and he was crazily unharmed. That being said, he wasn't able to save his mama. So good on you for trying buddy, but... I do hope one day you get to see her again. Number 8. Douglas Mawson Antarctic geologist Douglas Mawson had one of the most terrible experiences while on a polar expedition. One of the worst in history. He alongside colleague and friend Xavier Mertz and Lieutenant Belgrave Ninnis attempted an expedition of the South Pole in 1912. They took 3 sleds pulled by 16 huskies that carried 1720 pounds of food, survival gear and scientific instruments. 300 miles in they were making good time, but then strange things started happening. Mawson dreamed of his father who he later discovered died that day, and they found one of the huskies devouring a litter of puppies that they had. Not unusual for that climate, but still pretty ominous. Then a series of disasters struck. Ninnis along with his sled fell to his death into a massive crevice, along with most of their food and survival equipment. After several days traveling and slowly cooking their own dogs, Mertz fell into a delirium and died on January 8th, leaving Mawson alone on the tundra. Meanwhile, Mawson was left alone and he also fell snow blind. As Mawson continued, his feet became walking blisters and he nearly succumbed to several cracks in the ice and practically had to drag himself for miles to get to the base camp. Finally, he made it to base camp on February 8th with barely a semblance of the man he once was. His fight for survival remains one of the greatest examples of human resilience to this day. Coming in at number 7 we have Joan Murray. On September 25th, 1999, Joan Murray, a 47 year old bank executive and skydiver, drove to Chester, South Carolina for one of the scariest skydives of her career. Once the plane reached 14,500 feet above the ground, Joan jumped out of the plane only to discover that her parachute was not working. So what did she do? She cut off the defective chute and prepared to deploy the reserve chute. Her reserve chute opened, but it wasn't until she was 700 feet above the ground. For those that don't know skydiving that well, well, <laughs> that's a really close call. Joan hit the earth at 80 miles per hour and landed on top of a pit of fire ants. The ants bit her 200 times before she was finally retrieved by paramedics. It was thanks to these bites though that she was able to survive the shock of the fall as the reaction to these bites kept her heart beating. 
She was then rushed to hospital and was in a coma for two weeks. She then underwent 20 reconstructive surgeries, 17 blood transfusions, and after six weeks in hospital, she was finally able to stand once again. This is one crazy call with death, but Joan made it through. Once again, another one I can't even fathom, and now I will officially never skydive no matter what and no matter how curious I get. This one is crazy. Number six, Mauro Prosperi. Real life is stranger than fiction. Adrenaline junkies will do anything for that rush they get when the stakes are really high. And Mauro Prosperi was no exception. Italian Mauro Prosperi loved to push himself, so he decided to take on the Marathon of Sands in the Sahara Desert, a six day marathon across the desert covering 156 miles. Usually there are thousands of people who join for the strength in numbers mentality, but in the year Mauro did it, which was 1994, there were just 134 competitors. A father of three and 39 years old, Mauro did everything he could to prepare, but nothing prepared him for the massive sandstorm on the fourth day. Mauro kept running and when it passed, he completely lost his way. From a challenging marathon to a quest for survival, Mauro did everything he could to endure. He licked the dew off of rocks drank his own urine, and indulged in rats, lizards, and bird eggs he discovered in an abandoned temple. Still, with no rescue in sight and days of searching, Mar became so disheartened he tried to take his own life. But his blood was too dehydrated, it just coagulated too soon, so he was forced to continue. Eventually, he discovered a puddle with enough water to revive him, but he had to take small sips, because otherwise it would just all come up. Finally, he was found wandering by a shepherd girl. He lost 35 pounds weight, in at 99 pounds when they found him, and his liver had almost entirely failed. His survival story has been described as nothing short as superhuman. What's crazy, this is crazy, he went back and he completed it in 2012. This time he stayed on the path and there was no sandstorm, but he actually went back after that. Coming in at our halfway point at number five, we have Julianne Kopeck. Julianne went through something that I know Dewey Stewart would never have survived. Julianne was supposed to graduate on December 23rd, 1971, but her mother wanted to fly out on the 19th or 20th. But Julianne disagreed with that and wanted to stay for her graduation. So her mom booked a flight on Christmas Eve instead. Quite horrifically and tragically, while on the flight, the plane was struck by lightning, which nearly fully disintegrated the craft two miles above the ground. Julianne stayed strapped into her seat as the plane quickly approached the earth and she braced for impact. Miraculously enough, she survived with only a broken collarbone and a couple of cuts on her arms and legs. She then survived off a bag of sweets that she found at the crash site and traveled along a nearby stream until she came to a cabin. After surviving 11 days in the jungle, she was rescued by local fishermen and rushed to hospital. Once she was reunited with her father and fully healed, she returned to the crash site to help rescue and recover what they could. She heartbreakingly found her deceased mother who had passed in the crash. I can't even fathom going through something like this, but Julianne did. Julianne, I'm very, very sorry for your loss, but major kudos to you for surviving and helping out the rescue and recovery. That's major respect. By the way, if you want a part two, because there's actually a lot of really cool stories, let us know in the comments. Make sure to like, subscribe, do your thing. Anyways, number four, Sir Adrian Carton de Wart. After I'm finished this tale, you'll understand why he was dubbed the unkillable soldier. The only thing that eventually took him was the thing that takes us all, time. DeWart served in the Boer War and both World Wars. Throughout all three, he was, okay, ready? Shot in the face, lost his left eye and hand, shot through the skull, hip, leg, and ear, and he survived. This guy was literally a boss. He was seen pulling pins out of grenades and throwing them with his one good arm during the Battle of the Somme, which if you don't know, was one of the absolute worst battles between both world wars. Despite the haughty depictions of generals in say like Black Adder, he was always on the battlefield serving as a general beside his men, a hero to the highest order. In April 1941, while on a military mission in Yugoslavia, in his 60s, no less, his plane was shot down in the Mediterranean. He survived the crash, swam to shore again, in one arm and then captured by Italian soldiers and put into a POW camp. 
He then tried to escape and even successfully eluded capture for 8 days. But he didn't look Italian so it was pretty easy to spot. He was released 2 years later and Churchill then sent him to be his representative in China. Eventually the man retired from life on the battlefield and lived out the rest of his days in County Cork fishing until passing peacefully at the age of 83 because none of the rest of it killed him. Starting us off in our top 3 at number 3 we have Karina Chikitova. July 27th 2014, 3 year old Karina Chikitova unknowingly followed her father through the wilderness and took off the beaten path. She lost her way and ended up finding herself in Siberia's taiga forest. Both parents unaware that the other didn't know her whereabouts because of poor network connection in the area suspected nothing. Karina's mother only realized her daughter had gone missing 4 days after she trekked off with the dog. 4 days? Four. Four. four Isn't that crazy? Four, four, your child is missing for four days. Let that sink in. Nida the dog came back after nine days and assisted the rescue teams in finding the little girl. For the 11 days she was out in the wilderness, she survived off berries and water from the fresh streams. Let me just remind you all, she was three years old. So this one is absolutely insane. She was three. She was saved by her dog. This is quite literally an example of a man's best friend confirming the title and an incredibly intelligent three year old. I would have been a goner. I was dumb at three, I'm still dumb now. I would not have been able to do it. Number two, Anthony Borges. Wow. Anthony not only survived the impossible, he also put himself at risk to save his entire class of 20, which he did. Anthony was a student at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Some of you may recognize this name for the Parkland shooting which sadly took the lives of 17 people with 17 others severely injured and there would have been more if it weren't for Anthony. When shots rang out on February 14, 2018, Borges used his body to block the door of a classroom resulting in 5 gunshots going through his body. Thanks to him, over a dozen students were saved and remarkably, this is the crazy part, Anthony survived. He was shot in the back and his legs as he locked the door and used his body as a barricade. His friend Carlo Rodriguez said in a statement to ABC News, and I quote, None of us knew what to do so he took the initiative to save his other classmates, unquote. That is nothing short of heroic. Thank you, Anthony. And finally, coming in at number one, we have Tim Lancaster. On June 10th, 1990, British Airways Flight 5390 took off from the Birmingham airport. The plane rose to an altitude of 23,000 feet when all of a sudden, there was a loud bang. Luckily, it happened just as air steward Nigel Ogden entered the cockpit. Due to extreme decompression, two of the six windscreens shattered and Tim Lancaster was immediately sucked out of the plane. But Nigel, with his crazy fight or flight response, pun not intended, grabbed a hold of Lancaster's legs as the co pilot made a descent and called for an emergency landing at Southampton Airport. Yeah, he was holding onto him through the windshield of the plane. Lancaster only suffered a fractured right arm, wrist, severe frostbite, and Ogden dislocated his shoulder, damaged his eye, and suffered frostbite on his face as well. <laughs> but that's it. Luckily, these two survived this crazy event, but it was later discovered that the windscreens were only installed just 27 hours prior to when the plane took off. And the mechanics mistakenly used bolts that were much shorter in diameter than the standard bolts that they should have used. This one does not help my fear of flying one bit, and this one. It, like it, it just leaves me speechless. I think I would have actually died from a heart attack or shock before anything else. Like, not kidding. But Nigel, freaking bless your soul, and Tim, just wow. I, I yeah, I can't. I can't. At number ten, Hoon Lim. Back during World War II, nowhere was safe. Allied forces were risking their lives wherever they went because those they were fighting seemed to have been one step ahead every time. One of the most dangerous places for allies was in open water because fleets were crossing the ocean trying to bring supplies back and forth from the front lines and German forces were waiting to strike from above and below water. In 1942, a British ship was crossing the Atlantic Ocean coming from South Africa on its way to deliver supplies but once the ship reached the coast of South America, it was torpedoed and it sank. The only person to survive was a member of the ship's crew named Poon Lim and he managed to jump ship just before it sank. Because of the conditions, Poon Lim might not have survived had his luck not come through. You see, after jumping ship, he managed to find one of the ship's rafts and some canisters of water and food floating in the water. With this, he was able to survive drifting off the coast of South America for 133 days before he was found and rescued by a Brazilian fisherman. Other than having a severe sunburn and some stomach issues from eating raw fish that he was able to catch, Poon was in good health when he was found. This man survived all odds and went on to live in the US until 1991. 
Number 9, Matt Suter. Are you a big fan of the film Twister? Well, today we have a story that might just be better than the movie. What? Matt Suter literally rode a tornado and lived to tell the tale. Yeah. In 2006, Matt was at his grandmother's trailer, standing on the couch trying to seal the window because there was a storm outside. The weather was really bad, but he didn't know how bad until the floor started moving and everything started like swirling around him. The doors were being torn off. Matt was in the middle of being swept up in a tornado. The next moment, he was sucked out of a collapsing wall into a whirling, swirling darkness. Also, forget ruby slippers, the guy was only in his underpants. He really shouldn't have survived this. Like, he really shouldn't have, especially with all the debris flying around. But flash forward to Suter regaining consciousness about three football fields away, 390 meters from the trailer, making him, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, the farthest distance survived in a tornado. What's even crazier is all he had were like a few scrapes and bruises. Yeah. In at number 8, Louis Zamperini. This next individual not only survived one life-altering event, but two, and it's pretty incredible. Back in 1943, during World War II, Louis Zamperini and his crewmates were flying their plane during a rescue mission over the Pacific when something malfunctioned and they crashed. They survived the initial crash and found refuge on a raft, but after 33 days, one of their crewmates passed away, leaving Lewis and one other member. Those two were able to survive on that raft for 47 days, living off fish and rainwater, and soon they were found by Japanese forces, but that's when things got even worse for them. They were captured and tortured by a camp sergeant who was referred to as the bird. While imprisoned, Lewis endured so much. At one point, the bird ordered the other prisoners to take turns punching Lewis in the face for two straight hours. Another time, Lewis was forced to hold a large heavy beam over his head for nearly 40 minutes before being forcibly knocked to the ground. But even after all of that, Lewis ended up surviving the war and was liberated in 1945. He even went out of his way to meet with the bird one last time years later to tell him that he forgave him for everything that he was put through. Talk about a survival story. Number 7, Dr. Anna Bagenholm. In May 2000, on her usual ski trail in Narvik, Norway, Dr. Anna, at age 29, was ready for a break. But there were some unexpected turns in her trip that would make her world renowned. She lost her balance suddenly on a gully, which launched her headfirst into an icy river. She was stuck, submerged under the ice, but Anna managed to reach an air pocket that might have saved her life. Her torso and head were stuck for 40 minutes while she struggled to break through. Anna was no doubt exhausted and her body was sinking slowly into a deathly state of hypothermia. Still, she maintained her determination, but it would be another 40 minutes before her companions found her and cut her out of the ice, dragged her out. But by then, her body temp had significantly dropped to 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Night. She should have died minutes later, but somehow she held on. Doctors were able to revive her by slowly warming her blood. In 2013, Bagenholm began working in the very same hospital that saved her life, and her case led to investigations into therapeutic hypothermia. Strangely enough, it may have been the cold that helped save her. At number six, Slavomir Rovix. You know that song, 500 Miles? You know, the one where the guy is singing about how he would walk 500 miles and would walk 500 more and all that jazz? Well, imagine if it wasn't 500, but 4,000. Would you still walk that far? Well, if you're in a life or death situation like Slavomir Rovix, then you might. Slavomir was a Polish cavalry officer in World War II who was captured by German forces, sent to Moscow in 1939, and was later sentenced to 25 years of hard labor in Siberia. Bad start. Siberia is known for its harsh winter climate, so this sentence was going to be very, very harsh, and Slavomir wanted none of that. By 1941, during a blizzard, Slavomir and six other inmates managed to hatch a plan and escape from the prison that they were being held in. Desperate to get as far away from the enemy as possible, the prisoners walked 4,000 miles crossing the Gobi Desert and the Himalayas, enduring blazing heat, intense cold, thirst, starvation, and exhaustion. They were eventually able to reach safety in India, where they were rescued by a Gurkha patrol, and by this point, Slavomir only weighed 70 pounds. 
Later on in life though, he wrote a book about his miraculous survival. Number 5 Helen Clayben Helen Clayben took a nose dive out of her comfort zone when she decided to see what life was like outside of New York City. What she didn't know was that she would encounter a challenge far larger than what she bargained for. After her stint in Fairbanks concluded, she hopped on a plane with pilot Ralph Flores. Due to a heavy storm and lack of tech control, their plane crashed in the Alaskan wilderness at minus 40 degrees Celsius below. Oh, no thank you. Both were severely injured. Helen broke her arm and crushed her foot. Flores had lacerations and a broken jaw. Despite all odds, the pair survived on toothpaste, tree bark, snowshoes, and whatever else they could find over 49 days. Their meager rations ending 15 days in. Clayben got frostbite and gangrene in her broken foot and it wasn't until the two carved SOS into the snow that they were finally rescued. For a woman who had never left Brooklyn to survive without emergency gear or rations with a gangrenous foot, this story is like... At number 4, Janelle Guzman McMillan. The attacks on the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001 changed the lives of so many and it was a moment where the world seemed to have stood still. There are so many stories from those who were affected by the events of the attack, one of those stories being that of Janelle Guzman McMillan, a woman who survived the attack against all odds. Janelle sat down for an interview to tell her story about how she miraculously survived the attack and told the source about how she was working in one of the towers when the attack took place. She said that at first there was no sign of smoke or fire and her boss told the company to just remain calm and wait for help, but instead Janelle headed for the stairway. She started heading down the stairs, but by the time she got to the 13th floor, she went to go take off her shoe and suddenly a wall fell on her, pinning her feet and trapping her head between two blocks of concrete. The only thing that Janelle was able to move was her left hand and when she tried opening her eyes, everything was black. She laid in the rubble for 27 hours before being rescued after she was spotted by one of the many search and rescue dogs that were brought to the site. Janelle ended up being the last living person to be rescued from the wreckage. Number 3, Mary Vincent. This one gets pretty dark, so please trigger warning for anyone who wants to avoid severe tales of violent attacks and assaults. Just leaving that out there. I couldn't leave this story off the list, it's so incredible. Mary Vincent survived the impossible and continues to help survivors to this day. In September 1978, Mary Vincent was hitchhiking to Berkeley, California when 50 year old Lauren Singleton picked her up. He looked harmless, but little did Mary know he would change her life forever. He viciously attacked Mary, cut off both her arms. Ugh, and threw her off a cliff. He thought she was dead, but Mary, oh no, no one messes with Mary. This girl is the real Kill Bill. This woman, armless, stripped, and in excruciating pain, climbed back up the cliff, was rescued by a couple on their honeymoon, and proceeded to toss her assailant behind bars. The one thought that kept her going was that she didn't want this to happen to anyone else. That literally got her out of her stupor and she climbed back up. Unfortunately, Lawrence was released just after 8 years into his sentence, eye roll, but then he took another life and after that got the death penalty. Lawrence died in 2001 from cancer and Mary, well she's an artist, has two amazing kids and continues to speak out against violence. Mary Vincent, you are a damn hero. I'm number 2, Old Christians Club. This next story of survival against odds was so unbelievable that it just had to be turned into a movie. In October of 1972, a Uruguayan plane en route from Chile, carrying a rugby team and their families, crash landed in the Andes Mountains. Of the 45 passengers on board, 25 of them survived, but just two weeks later, 8 more lost their lives when an avalanche hit the crash site. Because of the avalanche, the other survivors, who were trapped in the snow at an altitude of more than 13,000 feet, got desperate to survive and they had to resort to something pretty grisly. Hold on to your coats guys, cause this one's gonna get a little dark. The old Christian club survivors eventually resorted to eating the flesh of their dead friends and family who were preserved by the snow and cold. Two months after the crash, two of the remaining survivors got desperate and decided to wander off from the crash site and hiked off into the wilderness in search of any help. Miraculously, after 10 days of walking, they found a livestock herder and by the following day, they were able to get rescue crews and helicopters out to the crash site to save the remaining survivors. It is a miracle that they were able to survive so long. And 
And last but not least, Aaron Ralston. Don't worry, this list will not be 127 hours long by the time we are finished, but we are definitely going to talk about Aaron Ralston. If you have seen the film, then you may know the remarkable story of this rock climber. In April 2003, Aaron was taking on Utah's Blue John Canyon by himself when tragedy struck. While climbing, an 800 pound boulder fell onto Aaron, trapping and crushing his right hand entirely alone. Aaron had to do everything he could to survive. After chipping away at the boulder proved unsuccessful and a pulley rig with his climbing rope was useless, there was only one thing left. Ralston had to do the unthinkable and self amputate his own arm. He devised a turnkey and even though he had no feeling in his hand, Aaron had to painstakingly cut through each nerve and break his own bone, which he describes was a hundred times worse than any pain I've felt before." Unquote. No kidding. He then rappelled down the 60 foot cliff where a family hiking found him and called emergency services. Now equipped with a prosthetic, Aaron has remarkably begun climbing again because obviously nothing is impossible when it comes to Ralston. Number 10, BJ Penn, the wave pool. When MMA legend BJ Penn posts photos on Instagram covered in bruises, you usually wouldn't think anything of it. But last August, fans were shocked to hear his survival story after a wave pool sucked him into the engine room? What? The former two division UFC champion shared photos of his face, back and head scraped up from this horrific story. The actual incident happened a year prior at an undisclosed wave pool. Whoa! Uh, it's, uh, we don't know. Penn recalls surfing for about an hour before the line began to get long. At that point, he swam to the wall of the pool to catch up with the owner when suddenly Penn and his surfboard were sucked under the cement under the cement wall while it was building up water for the next wave. Oh my god! Penn shared that he felt like he was going to die. Yeah, quote, I remember feeling like I was getting sucked into a pipe and at that moment I got scared. It ended up pushing me into a big dark cement room that fills up with water to push the next wave for the wave pool. It felt like I was in the movie Saw or Final Destination. The fighter was on antibiotics for three weeks after the incident and even chose not to include the name of the water park involved. He was just happy he got out alive. Who knew catching waves could be as dangerous as catching hands. Oh my god. The last line. I love wave pools. Not anymore. Not anymore. God. Oh my god. Number 9. Pinnacle Plains Cave. You know it's a fun word, spelunking. I say it once a year, you know, obviously, because I don't spelunk often. What a great word though, right? Who doesn't want to spelunk around in some caves? But you know what's not so fun? A near-death experience during said spelunking. If it weren't for Andrew Wright in the panic in caves, 15 people would have met their end. That's right, he not only survived this terrifying event, but he saved 15 others too. Andrew was the captain of 15 people excited to explore these panic in caves, one of the deepest cave trails in the world, but then a rare cyclonic storm started brewing above them, to which the team was entirely unaware. But the storm caused the entire middle part of the cave to collapse, leaving them trapped underground with no way back. I'm having a panic attack. My worst fear is drowning. So this is, my toes are doing this right now while I'm reading this. All they had to hold on to was a small ledge and water was just flooding these caves. But then in comes Andrew being a badass. Andrew dove into the pool to try and find a way to swim out, which he succeeded in doing, but still it took the team 24 hours to be let out then to safety. An award-winning documentary called Nalarbor Dreaming was released about this event, which included footage from the event itself. Despite surviving this experience though, Andrew passed away in a helicopter crash in 2012 in New South Wales. Number 8, The Robertson Family. Back in 1971, Dougal, Lynn and their four children, Anne, Douglas, Neil and Sandy, set sail on what was planned to be a trip around the world. Aboard their 13 meter boat, the Lucette, they traveled through the Caribbean then across the Panama Canal to the Pacific. A year and a half went by, they were en route through the Galapagos and one of the daughters, Anne, who was 18, left the voyage in the Caribbean. Then in Panama, they took on a hitchhiker named Robin Williams. Not that one. Then west of the Galapagos Islands, a pod of killer whales hit the boat. What? Wood began to crack and the boat subsequently started to sink. They all moved to the inflatable life raft, but after 16 days of using their own breath to keep inflating it, the six of them were forced to move into a smaller dinghy. A smaller dinghy? They somehow survived for 38 days while sailing to the center of the Pacific. All they had to drink was some water left from the Lucette, with turtles being their main diet. After 38 days, they were finally spotted by a passing Japanese fishing trawler. That's not real. That is not real. Number seven, Chris Gursky. Chris Gursky was vacationing in Switzerland in November 2018 and decided to try something. Something a little new, something exciting, something to tell the kids at home, but then this happened. All right, I've never seen this. I don't know what I'm about to watch, but I'm terrified. Okay, so he's about to jump off this cliff, not 
Is he just hanging on to this man? Houston, we have a problem. I like how he added that in after. He's like, and this is when I said this joke. Yeah. <laughs> this guy just hung on the entire flight coming in hot. Yeah, you don't say it, man. You're not even fastened to this plane. So he hung on to this man the entire time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then he drifted all the way around for minutes. This is a longer video, we had to cut it. But there was minutes where this guy was hanging on and then he just lands in the grass. They're flying too. They're going yeah. like... 80 miles an hour, easy. Oh my God, and he was okay? This was the first day of our vacation in Switzerland. Well, hot start. Base jumping tomorrow, he says. Yeah, maybe just double check that you're attached to that base jumping cable. What I just saw was the pilot failing to attach Chris properly to the apparatus, resulting in him having to hold on for dear life. This tough dude held on for three minutes until the pilot could safely lower the craft enough so he could just slide off onto the grass. The pilot did help him out by holding his arm, but Gursky still tore his bicep because he had to hold on so tight. And then he kept hanging on after he tore this bicep. That is insane. He also broke his wrist in the fall, but he still had his life, which is thankful. Gursky commented himself, he remembered looking down and thinking, this is it. I was losing grip with my right hand. That was holding on to a strap on the pilot's right shoulder. Honestly, this is crazy. This is why I don't do anything up there. I like the ground. I like when I can, like I'm here, we're good. I'm not going, I'm not base jumping anytime soon, I don't think. Number six, Roy Sullivan. They say lightning never strikes the same place twice, but if you knew Roy Sullivan, you know that's not entirely true. Meet the man who was struck by lightning seven times and lived to tell the tale. Roy Sullivan was born in 1912. He passed in 1983 when he was 71 years old. He actually passed away 38 years ago today. Born in Greene County, Virginia, Roy was a park ranger Shenandoah National Park in 1936. Nicknamed the human lightning conductor and appearing in the Guinness Book of World Records, Roy's first encounter was when he was just 30 years old at a fire lookout tower. He said that lightning struck again out of the seven he survived was the most painful. The lightning bolt burned a strip all the way down his leg, even blowing a hole through his shoe. Roy was also hit by lightning in 1969 while driving a truck, 1970 while gardening on an otherwise clear day, 1972 while inside a guardhouse, inside a house, come on, 1973 during a storm, 1976 during another storm. <laughs> Stop being in storms, man. And finally in 1977 while fishing. He had a pole in his hand. How could you ignore that? This guy was like, I got it. Roy passed away in 1983, and to this day, two of his ranger hats are on display at Guinness World Exhibits in New York City and South Carolina. Number five, Tammy Ashcroft. Like me, you might be at this point in the list where you realize just how soft your life is. You know, like people are base jumping, hanging off of planes, getting hit by lightning over and over again. I will probably never have to deal with a 50 foot wave in my entire life, but Tammy Ashcroft, who survived 41 days alone at sea, in addition to losing the love of her life, did. Ashcroft and her fiance, Richard Sharp, were expert experienced sailors and were asked to deliver a 40 foot yacht to San Diego, California. Now, despite the 5,000 mile trek across the Pacific Ocean that it would require, the couple didn't think twice. Like I said, we're a little soft, other people like to explore the seas. They were confident they could do it. They set sail on the Hazana in September 1983, but in October, a category four hurricane hit and Richard was swept off the boat while Tammy was below deck, knocked unconscious when she was slammed against the cabin wall. When she woke up, the cabin was filled with water at this point and Richard's safety harness was off the side of the ship. Alone, Tammy fashioned a makeshift sail, pumped the water from the cabin and did everything she could to survive. She survived on canned fruit and salad for 41 days before a Japanese research Research ship founder. Ashcroft commented, definitely the hardest part was dealing with Richard being gone. Those were times that I didn't even want to live anymore because I didn't know how I was going to go on without him. I was never going to fall in love again, but she did years later. All right, number four, Truman Duncan. The man who was cut in half by a train and still managed to call 911. I didn't expect to read that today. Back in 2006, Truman Duncan was working in the rail yards in Claiborne, Texas, and during his shift, Duncan was hitching a ride on the front of a train car that was heading towards the repair dock when all of a sudden the 38 year old just slipped off. Huh? Huh? He tried to run backwards and catch his footing, of course, leaping out of the way of the train, but his lower half still managed to get caught underneath the wheel. Oh, that's an awful image. For 75 feet, Duncan was dragged until the rail car came to a complete stop. His body was cut nearly in half, with only one leg attached by a single muscle. 
Oh god, I can't even read. Duncan at this point was still able to call 911 and while they were racing to the scene he made another call but this time to talk to his family. Duncan recalls their horrific experience saying, the pain was real severe and then it just kind of wasn't there. He wanted to make sure he could stay awake because in his mind that was the only thing he could see himself surviving. And after a double amputation, Truman was given the best of medical care from the staff at Fort Worth Hospital and luckily was able to see his family again. Number 3. The Chilean Mining Accident Ten years ago, one of the most famous rescue missions occurred in which 33 workers were rescued. Thank you for mentioning this, this is great. At 2 in the morning on August 5th, 2010, the San Jose Gold and Copper Mine caved in, leaving 33 workers trapped beneath the surface at 700 meters deep, except nobody knew. They tried searching for life, but to no avail. They kept trying and trying, but on August 7th, second collapse occurred, blocking access to the ventilation shaft. Now it's not looking great at all. They sent probes down in freshly drilled holes, and it was then that a probe brought to the surface a note written by one of the men. They became known as the Lost 33. Over the course of 17 days, the men survived on rations until solid food could be passed through these drilled holes. They drilled three holes in total. They had plan A, plan B, and plan C. The rescue was expected to take until December, but in October, plan B got through and was lined with metal tubing to prepare for evacuation. By the evening of October 12th, every last man had been removed from these tunnels, and considering how long these guys were stuck down there besides mild infection, these guys were relatively unscathed, which blows my mind reading this. After this horrible event, these men faced some severe trauma, as many never expected they would live after this, but after two months, they all survived, luckily. Number two, Matthew Lowe. If you saw 25 year old Matthew Lowe two years after this factory accident, you would have no idea what kind of pain he endured. The young worker was working on a steel processing machine when the father of one was suddenly dragged through a five inch gap. That's like this? What? I can't, that's like my, that's like my thigh. His back broke in two different places, both hips were fractured, along with numerous ribs, you can tell I don't deal with this very well. The only sound he heard as he was being squeezed through the small gap was his right arm snapping. Matthew shared his experience years after, saying that as the machine dragged him through, he just relaxed almost because he knew he couldn't do anything, and he also knew that that was the end. Six operations later and a month of resting, Matthew feels lucky to be alive, and you show me a picture of this guy, and he looks fine. Like nothing I, uh, okay, that's, that's enough for me today. And finally, coming in at number one, Angela Hernandez. You know those epic car crashes in movies where the villain's vehicle tumbles down the side of the cliff for like eight minutes, and you're like, no, there's no way they could have survived that. Then they get out, they still have a cape, and they wink at the camera, and sets up the sequel. They are definitely dead. This is not reality at all. After two of those flips, you are a goner. Well, Angela Hernandez just proved every I'm back from the dead plot twist in soap operas because she survived this. In July 2018, Hernandez was driving near Big Sur down a highway in her SUV, and a small animal was crossing the road at that time, so she swerved to miss it, but she overcorrected, and her car flung off the road and tumbled down a 200 feet rocky cliff. 200 feet. She suffered a brain hemorrhage, fractured ribs, a broken collarbone, ruptured blood vessels in both eyes, a collapsed lung, and still she didn't die. That is an incredibly strong woman. She came to, still in her car, and she broke the window, climbed out, swam to the beach, and then passed out. So she landed in water. Yeah. When she woke up again, she walked along the shore for help in bare feet, just obviously a wreck, and she used a tube from her car to collect dripping water from moss and then screamed at cars above her for help. This is amazing. Finally, after seven days, hikers found her wrecked car and went searching for her, and they found her sleeping at this point on some rocks, and rescuers descended from a cliff and then brought her to a hospital. How? I know. How? I know. That is a crazy number one. That chick, that she is incredibly strong. That woman is incredibly strong. I'm happy you're alive. Somehow, no idea how you did that, but write books. Write seven books and we'll read them all.